Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Welcome to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today, Illusion or Reality, the Trump Kim meeting. And joining us via Skype from the University of Denver in Denver, Colorado, is uh, Ambassador Christopher Hill, United States State Department retired. Ambassador Hill, during his uh, long career with the State Department, served as ambassador to South Korea, as well as Assistant Secretary of State uh, for East Asia and Pacific Affairs. Today, he is the Senior Advisor for Global Engagement to the Chancellor of the University of Denver. And moreover, he's a published author, having recently published Outpost, a, a diplomatic memoir. In fact, before we go any further, let's put that image of the cover of uh, Ambassador Hill's book up on the screen so everybody can see it. And I know this book can be purchased uh, by going to Amazon.com, and uh, it seems to be selling very well. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Great. Well, let's get right into it. Um, wow. What's your reflection on the Kim Moon meeting that just took place very, very recently right at Pan Munjom? Well, first of all, this uh, story basically started on New Year's Day when uh, everyone kind of expected a sort of blood-curdling uh, annual address from Kim Jong-un, hmm. and instead it was quite different. He was very uh, uh, conciliatory to the South. Meanwhile, the South was worried about a lot of things, not the least of which was the Olympics that were due to take place. So um, Moon Jae-in, the, uh, the president of South Korea, immediately followed up on uh, on Kim's kind of warm words, they sent a delegation there, and lo and behold, Kim uh, indicated, and I want to stress this is still a work in progress, but indicated a willingness to consider denuclearization, and in particular, uh, a big interest in uh, talking with President Trump. In the meantime, uh, Kim, uh, Kim and uh, Moon had a summit meeting between the two Koreas in the so-called Peace Village in Panmunjom. And essentially, that has given more momentum uh, toward this uh, summit with uh, President Trump. It's um, still very hard to see how this is going to turn out. There's been relatively very little staff work on it. They don't really have a joint communicate that we're aware of. And there's no real clear indication of where the summit's going to go. So um, as uh, our president likes to say, we'll see. <laughs> well, uh, okay, I suppose that, you know, you've kind of touched on this indirectly, but it, was this meeting between um, uh, Kim and Moon really, did it really have substance, or was it just posturing, or now, how do you see it? Well, I don't think there was, frankly, a lot of substance. The fact that they had the meeting is substance, I guess, in and of itself. But there's obviously not a lot of substance. It's not clear. They had a joint communique where they both expressed the desire to have a, uh, a nuclear-free Korean peninsula. Nothing wrong with that. Um, Kim, uh, Kim Jong-un uh, made the surprise announcement or surprise decision that they're going to change uh, North Korea's time zone, which um, is half an hour off from South Korea. They're going to harmonize it with South Korea. I'm not sure that in and of itself was a particularly momentous uh, event for a summit. So uh, your point's well taken. There was not a lot decided there, except that clearly the whole body language of the thing, the whole uh, sort of warmth of the thing, suggested that uh, indeed there's now going to be a, uh, a summit between Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump. And so in a way, this summit prepared for that. So uh, that's going to happen, you know, in a pretty short period of time. Uh, is there any um, basis to the notion that Kim was playing Moon? That given Moon has this, has a history of having these very strong Pan Korean sentiments, and I believe his family originally came from North Korea. Um, and and I, I heard the the I listened to. Um, Kim Jong -un, translations of Kim Jong Un's speeches when he's talked about we're one people, we're all the same blood. Was he was he playing Moon? Well, I mean to say he's playing Moon, you'd have to see some further results. 
so far there hasn't been any diminution of the sanctions. There hasn't been any sort of material improvement in uh, uh, North Korea's terms. So I think it's premature to make a comment that he's playing moon. That said, as your, as your uh, question or statement implies, uh, Moon Jae-in, his party, it has a lot of people who favor this kind of pan-Korean activity who somehow blame foreigners for the fact of uh, Korea's uh, mm. uh, division. And by the way, there's some historical truth to that. So I think uh, Moon, uh, uh, I, and by the way, there are a lot of people in South Korea don't approve of this kind of outreach to North Korea. So um, there's a lot to be a little worried about. Moreover, I think the long-term aim of uh, Kim Jong-un, of the North Koreans, is not so much to nuke the United States or nuke Korea, South Korea. It's really to somehow decouple the U.S. from South Korea. So I think there's mm. a lot of speculation that maybe the purpose of this meeting was to somehow say to the South Koreans, hey, we can be a good neighbor even if we have nuclear weapons. <laughs> I, I, I personally, I tend to fall into that camp to think that this is an attempt to drive a wedge in between the United States and South Korea. And I, I guess, as you say, as President Trump says, we will see. Um, but tell me this. Did you see something um, in Kim uh, at, the, at the Panmunjom meeting that you didn't see in him before, the certain characteristics about him come out that perhaps you didn't suspect existed? Uh, was there anything surprising about his behavior or demeanor? Um, you know, a lot of people have pointed to some of the things he said uh, to Moon Jae-in, such as, you know, we're embarrassed by the poor state of our road system. This is a sort of the example of self-deprecating uh, statements that North Korean leaders are not particularly known for. Uh, he also apparently showed a sense of humor and was smiling a lot to the cameras. Frankly, none of that really surprised me that much. Uh, I think, uh, you know, North Korean leaders uh, always like to look very self-assured and kind of in control. So, uh, again, I think the real issue is going to be uh, how is denuclearization going to play out, or if it's going to play out, is he looking for sanctions of relief from South Korea? Is he looking for investments and other things? And is he going to uh, essentially look at denuclearization as some type of long-term uh, thing that uh, isn't going to happen in anyone's lifetime? If that's where, where he's heading, I think uh, this uh, sort of era of somehow you know, uh, detente or warmth is going to uh, change very quickly. I, you know, and I want to stress, too, that South Koreans weren't born yesterday. They know about North Korean behavior. They don't need, um, you know, lectures or admonishments from Americans. They know very well uh, what they're up against there. But I think it has been important for the U.S. to take this issue seriously and not to appear to be throwing cold water on it and otherwise to be saying to the Koreans somehow, you know, we don't trust what uh, you, the South Koreans, are doing. Uh, this is uh, kind of big and dangerous stuff, and you've got to be more careful. So I don't think that's the right approach for Americans to take. Instead, I think uh, the president has done the right thing by saying, okay, I'll meet with him. Mm. And there was also talk after the, the meeting between Kim and Moon that there would be a road constructed connecting uh, Seoul with Pyongyang. There would be an air link open. There would be a rail link um, constructed. Do you see any of that happening? Yeah, I wouldn't sit on the stove till that happens. Uh, <laughs> I, think, uh, I think, you know, these kinds of things always get announced. Uh, I think the South Koreans uh, look at their relationship with the United States, their relationship with the international community, and uh, that's more important to them than to make some sort of fictitious progress with the North Koreans. So I don't, I don't look for uh, Moon or, frankly, any South Korean president to be doing things that are inconsistent with South Korea's obligations. Uh, whether it's to uh, to uphold U.N. sanctions or otherwise, I just don't see the South Koreans creating a circumstance where they have a lot of problems with the United States while they're uh, engaged in a so-called warming exercise with the North Korea. 
Hey, has the United States underestimated the North Koreans? Well, I think uh, certainly in the last couple of years, the North Koreans have made tremendous progress on their nuclear program and on their missile program. And so I think that progress, you could argue, has amounted to an underestimation by the U.S. Uh, with the view that somehow uh, no one thought they would move this far this fast. Ten years ago, when I was negotiating with the North Koreans, they had a uh, young beyond nuclear reactor. They were reprocessing uh, nuclear fuel uh, or spent fuel turned into uh, plutonium. Uh, they also had had some missile tests, but relatively few, and the only nuclear test was more of a fizzle than a success. Now all of that has changed, and I think the rapidity with which it's changed was surprising to many analysts. Mm. Okay, I think this is a good place for us to take a break. Uh, you're watching Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today is Ambassador uh, Christopher Hill, who served as U.S. Uh, Ambassador to South Korea and also as Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and Pacific Affairs. We'll be back in one minute, so don't go away. みなさんこんにちは。ティンクテックハワイが日本語でお届けする。こんにちはハワイの日本語放送のホスト国末ゆかりです。各週月曜日の2時からお届けしています。日本語コミュニティ、ハワイの日本語コミュニティに便利なお
uh, number one. So, uh, yes, they're going to know it very well. Uh, this is what they do. Uh, and I think it's true that those who kind of looked at this sort of, uh, you know, corpulent uh, uh, physique of Kim Jong-un and sort of assumed that he was a, a sort of a cartoon of some kind have since discovered that the guy obviously has some smarts and knows what he's talking about. Uh, I think, though, it's very important to understand that at this point, uh, at this stage in the process, we really don't know what we have. Do we have a... Uh, uh, the beginnings of a nuclear deal, or do we have just an elaborate uh, uh, photo opportunity? And so we really don't know. And normally what a president would do in, in the circumstances of a summit is to send uh, his national security advisor to meet with the other side's national security advisor, and they might table a joint communique so that the results of the uh, meeting are known in, in advance. We don't have any sign that that's happened. Uh, certainly, uh, Mike Pompeo went to North Korea, but we really don't have much uh, indication of what he was able to do while he was there, apart from talk to the North Koreans and conclude they were serious about a, uh, a summit meeting. So uh, a lot of questions in the still to be answered. And uh, again, I think it's probably the correct thing for the president to go through with this, but I sure would like a much better indication of what it is uh, this is about. Mm, interesting. Of course, the other day, um, just the other day, uh, President Trump boasted um, that it was because of his get tough policy that the meeting between Kim and uh, Moon was came about. Uh, and that really annoyed and really upset uh, Kim Jong-un. What should we make out of all that? Is that just a tactic on Kim Jong-un's part that is leading up to, well, you said this, you offended us, so give us this, give us yeah. that, make this concession, or how, what, what should we make out of that? Well, I guess even brutal dictatorships have their own politics, maybe even their own feelings. So, huh. uh, you know, they, they obviously were not amused at President Trump. And uh, I must say that the issue that runs through my mind is there was a lot of sort of uh, end zone dancing about the, uh, the prospect of the three Americans being released. And as of uh, this moment, uh, to my knowledge, they've not been released. Uh, maybe they will be, but they've not been released. So I, can, I think it does speak to the fact that when you go into a negotiation with the North Koreans, you should spend a little less time sort of talking about how you somehow scared them into a negotiation and a little more time preparing for the actual uh, negotiation. Look, at this point, all we have is an agreed meeting where Kim Jong-un will come and he will talk, uh, and we don't even know where. We don't really know the precise date, but Kim Jong-un will go somewhere, and President Trump will go somewhere, and they'll have a meeting. Uh, I'm not sure you could say that Kim Jong-un was scared into that. Now, if Kim Jong-un shows up and they bring a, uh, you know, a few trucks full of uh, fissile material and give up all their nuclear weapons, then I think our president should be able to take a lot of credit for that. But at this point, I would, uh, you know, not talk about who's getting credit and uh, rather work a little harder to be prepared for this meeting. Yeah, that's a really interesting comment. You know, it seems to me sometimes uh, Americans have a, we have a habit of taking the victory lap a bit early. We took the victory lap on the democratization of Myanmar, it seems to me, pretty early. And Aung San Suu Kyi is proving to be probably a bit disappointing. Well, you know, I think uh, sometimes it's we make conclusions that are too early, as you suggest, and uh, we don't really know these people that we're conferring sainthood on. In the case of uh, the leader or the um, de facto leader of Burma, She's obviously a very talented person who understands the politics of her country, and I'm not sure she's changed her views so much as we just didn't understand them in the first place. Mm, interesting. Well, uh, okay, we've, we've in, so far in this interview, we talked about the U.S. or suggested a lack of U.S. trust of North Korea. But can, on the other uh, side of the coin, can North Korea trust the United States? And the reason I say this is we're about, it seems, to pull out of a nuclear deal with Iran. And how will that 
impact North Korea's level of trust towards the United States? Well, um, to sort of uh, paraphrase Tina Turner, I mean, what's trust got to do with it? It's all about verification and whether mutual obligations can be verified as uh, ones that uh, both sides will be pursuing. And you pursue the obligations not by having one side fulfill all their obligations and wait for the other side to start uh, uh, doing what they're supposed to do, but rather you work this on a sort of step-by-step -step sequencing basis. So I think that's probably, you know, if there's anything that comes of this, it'll be in a very sort of tight uh, scenario, a tight sequence of, uh, of each side doing certain things. Uh, but as your question implies, we have a president, President Obama, whose team concluded an agreement with Iran along with Britain, France, Germany, Russia, uh, and um, China, as well as the European Union itself. And uh, normally when you have that type of major executive uh, uh, decision, uh, the next president would not want to change that for fear that it will look like the United States is in somewhat disarray and you can't really uh, trust uh, uh, any decision we make because we can't seem to get two administrations in a row to do it. So uh, I wish that issue were more front and center with our current president than it appears to be. Uh, yet I think he's spent a lot of time uh, uh, essentially denying that President Obama did anything of any value. He's also spent a lot of time talking about something that I'm not sure he uh, understands that well, that is the agreement with, with Iran. And I think he's kind of put himself into a position now where he almost feels he has to uh, sort of uh, rescind our agreement to this, given all the millions of times he's called it the worst deal in the world. What's interesting about North Korea is not only the fact that if we pull out of Iran, North Korea might be concerned that we do the same to them. The issue is also that even in the best of circumstances, Kim Jong-un will probably, uh, if, if he gives up anything, it will not be nearly as robust as what was done with Iran, where they've actually uh, taken most of the fissile material out of that country. So the president wants to say the deal with Iran is the worst deal in the world. But when he comes back from wherever his meeting was with Kim Jong-un, he's going to have to sell that as somehow a better deal when far less will have been accomplished. So that will be something worth uh, buying a ticket to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we're down to our last two minutes, but let me, let me get into this question here. Uh, for some time, the relationship between North Korea and China has been strained, to say the least, and it seemed like Kim Jong-un was trying to do everything he could to stamp out Chinese influence in North Korea. And then, all of a sudden, he made a trip to uh, Beijing. Wang Yi, the foreign minister of China, I believe is in North Korea today, and Xi Jinping is supposed to be on his way. Well, what kind of influence is China having on this um, potential meeting between Kim and Trump? Well, I don't think China is going to be ignored on this issue. I think it's very important to China. They have a pretty substantial land border with uh, North Korea, uh, in the biggest land border that North Korea has. Uh, they've made no secret that they have not been very happy with Kim Jong-un. He's kind of uh, held them at, at uh, arm's length, uh, as if to say that his father was wrong to have a close relationship with China. And then when he took his, his uncle, Chung Sung Kek, and uh, essentially he was, he was in a party meeting, and the police came in and essentially perp-walked him out of the meeting and then had him shot the next day, the Chinese kind of took that rather personally. So... Mm. Um, all that is, all that is, um, you know, things are changing because China uh, doesn't want to be kind of kept at bay and kept out of this. Uh, that said, I think China is uh, in support very much of getting rid of nuclear weapons in North Korea. The issue, though, for China is they don't want to see a situation where North Korea somehow uh, suffers a demise, and then there's a perception that the U.S. has won and China has lost. I mean, uh, the Chinese often talk about win-win solutions. I'm not sure they really know what win-win is. I think they think it's a, a Burmese dissident or something. 
I think they're much more inclined to think it's win-lose, and they would lose if North Korea was somehow to uh, collapse and South Korea becomes a successor state. So, in short, they have a big stake in all this. A lot of the churn within China, there's a lot of political churn within China, it would be affected by a major shift in what's happening in, in North Korea. So, I think it behooves this administration, any administration that we stand on, we need to work closely with China. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining us today. I'm afraid we're going to have to stop here. Of course, there's a lot of other things we could talk to, but we always seem to run out of time. So thank you very much for joining us today. It was really great for you to uh, take some time out of your evening to join us from your home in uh, Denver. And thank you and our audience for watching, and we'll see you again.